A not insignificant portion of Star Wars fans believe that with his decisions in Episode 8, Ryan Johnson has ruined the entire franchise. But I'm going to lay out the argument that it was actually J.J. Abrams and The Force Awakens that ruined maybe not the whole franchise, but at the very least ruined the sequel trilogy and the conclusion of the Skywalker saga. Now forget for a moment how much you may personally hate Ruin Johnson. Yes, he made a lot of mistakes completely on his own, but the fact is that several of the terrible plot points in Episode 8 came directly from what J.J. Abrams established in Episode 7. Problem number one, ambiguity. Now, if there's a common reaction among Star Wars fans regarding The Force Awakens, it was, it wasn't a great movie, but at least it created a good foundation for future films. Feel free to scroll through all these audience reviews. The majority are mediocre at best because the thing is, JJ's version of Episode 7 didn't create a strong foundation. It created an ambiguous, unstable foundation where the storyline was fractured with possibilities. J.J. is known for works like Lost or Fringe or Cloverfield, where the audience is intentionally left in suspense with only part of a full story. Like this scene from the pilot episode of Lost, they're walking through a tropical island and are attacked by a polar bear. This cold climate animal being on a tropical island isn't explained until many episodes later, and that's what most of J.J.'s projects were about, creating stories that didn't initially make sense until they were explained much, much later on in the series. Super 8 didn't make sense until the end of the film. It's been locked up for years. It's terrified and hungry and it just wants to go home. Westworld is confusing twist after twist until the end of the season, which ends on a huge cliffhanger. Man, does JJ like his cliffhangers. I read that was actually the one thing the studio mandated he changed while filming Ilias. They said he couldn't keep ending each episode with big cliffhangers, and I'm shocked that Disney let him end The Force Awakens on one. And the Cloverfield movies, anything confusing there? That storyline wasn't even partially explained until we'd had the third film in the series. This experiment could unleash chaos. Or look at this quote from Abrams himself, saying Alias had become incredibly confusing. And look at Fringe. This article describing Fringe says, Nothing made any sense. While watching, I was a bit annoyed, but I don't think we were supposed to understand. Instead, we were meant to be confused. And this article that says, the producers of Fringe promised a couple years ago that there was a meaning to the show that they hadn't fully shared with us, which we would understand when we saw the final episode. That show went five seasons, had a hundred episodes, and JJ planned for us not to get full explanations until the final episode. Now yes, I acknowledge that for many of these projects, JJ may have only written the pilot and the first couple episodes, or he was just a producer, or he wasn't the only person creatively in charge, but think about it. Nearly all of the projects he's been involved with have had the same exact themes of ambiguity and mystery. So based off of his previous works, we knew going in that JJ's storyline for Star Wars would be ambiguous and confusing and it wouldn't be until late in the last film in the sequel trilogy when all of the pieces would finally come together. That's how JJ likes to write and his plans for Star Wars were no different. The problem was this wasn't JJ's trilogy. He was never supposed to direct all three films, and the story group had no overarching storyline that each director had to loosely adhere to. They were each given leeway to do their own thing, which is an obvious problem when you give the first film to a director who specializes in maintaining storyline ambiguity until the very end. I mean, seriously, we've never had a Star Wars film end on a cliffhanger before. With this ending, J.J. created all of the Who Are Rey's Parents conspiracy theories, all of the Who Are Snoke conspiracy theories, all of the What Was Luke Doing on the Island theories, the Why Is Snoke So Disfigured theories, the Who Are the Knights of Ren theories. Actually, the way J.J. wrote and then ended The Force Awakens was a perfect example of the Schrodinger's cat paradox. Luke could, at this point, be thought of as a Jedi Master and not a Jedi Master. And it's only in making the next movie will the character decide to be a Jedi and reach out and take the lightsaber, or decide not to be a Jedi and throw it away. Rey can at this point be considered to be both a well-written character with potential for an intricate backstory explaining her abilities 
and as a poorly written Mary Sue who can do anything without training nor explanation. Kylo could at this point be considered to be at a turning point in his journey to the dark side, leading to huge character development in the next film where he is calmer, more centered, and has fully embraced the villain that he is, and is far more powerful in the dark side. Or he could be the same uncertain, lost, temperamental teenager that he is in The Force Awakens. At this point, film could be paralyzed for life, or have to wear a Vader-looking cyborg suit just to live, or he could be completely fine. The problem here is not how Ryan Johnson dealt with the characters. The problem was how J.J. created them. J.J. treated Episode 7 like how he treated Lost or Fringe, like he had 90 more episodes to keep people guessing and to finally resolve cliffhangers and plot twists. But Star Wars has always been about self-contained films. No other film left us with so many unanswered questions. Who was his father? There was no father. It's possible he was conceived by the midichlorians. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it's this boy? Promise. Promise me you will train the boy. Yes, Master. Your apprentice, Skywalker, will be. The other he spoke of is your twin sister. Leia. Leia is my sister. Whomever you're waiting for on Jakku, they're never coming back. J.J. Abrams was not the right person to put in charge of the continuation of a major film series. I mean, look at this interview about the Cloverfield Paradox. J.J. openly admits that as they were shooting the movie, a movie that was the third part of a series, they had no idea how to make the story tie together with the other films. A filmmaker is a storyteller first and foremost, and J.J. Abrams seems to have completely lost sight of basic storytelling practices he used on great films like Armageddon, and instead he relies on suspense and mystery to keep people coming back for more. I mean, the dude did a 20-minute TED Talk about how much he loves mystery boxes in film. Island. Why so many mysteries? What is it about mystery that, that uh, I seem to be drawn to? And I, I was thinking about this, what to talk about at TED. But Star Wars has never been this type of film where most of the plot intentionally doesn't make sense until you view the next two films. And this graphic I made only covers some of the many mysteries that JJ introduced. Why did Kylo venerate Vader? A good question for another time. What was the work Vader had started that Kylo wanted to finish? A good question for another time. Why did Maz have Luke's lightsaber? Does that mean she had his hand in a pickle jar somewhere too? A good question. Was Finn the only stormtrooper to ever go rogue? A good question. Why would someone trust Unkar Pluck to raise Rey? A good question. Is Maz actually a psycho stalker and that's why Chewie avoided her by staying on the ship? What are you doing? J.J. does some amazing work, but his films and shows have almost always created more questions than they answered. The way he introduced characters and built the world they live in has fundamentally changed the genre Star Wars has always existed in. For these reasons I have laid out, I consider storyline ambiguity to be the second biggest mistake J.J. Abrams made that ruined the future of all the sequels. Now, here is what I consider to be the single greatest failure J.J. made with The Force Awakens that ruined the entire sequel trilogy. As many potential problems as the ambiguous storyline caused, those problems didn't impact the story nearly as much as the character and story development that took place off-screen between episodes 6 and 7. Nearly every issue that fans have with the sequel trilogy stems from having a lack of on-screen story and character development. Now, first off, let's get something straight. J.J. Abrams ruined Luke Skywalker long before Ryan Johnson did. Ben Solo turned evil, killed all of Luke's students, and Luke ran away. That was J.J.'s story. Luke didn't go confront Ben. He didn't go try to save Ben. He didn't go confront his other students that Ben took with him when he left. Luke didn't try to go save those other students. Luke didn't go and try to confront Snoke and save the galaxy from another Sith Lord Emperor. His students were slaughtered, his protege lost and confused and tempted by evil, and Luke decides to play Indiana Jones and go look for the ruins of the first Jedi Temple. J.J. ruined Luke's character by having him disappear when the situation was most dire. That is not in his character. So Ryan was partially correct. The portrayal of Luke in The Last Jedi was 100% consistent 
with the already broken, cowardly version of Luke that J.J. decided to give us. Anyways, back to the main point. Many people I've talked to would, albeit reluctantly, have accepted emotionally broken Hobo Luke if we had seen that character arc and followed him on his journey from hero to zero. The problem isn't actually that they quote-unquote ruined Luke Skywalker. The problem is we didn't see his fall from grace. So this is the Luke we remember. Never. I'll never turn to the dark side. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. While you're now saying this is who Luke actually is. And for the briefest moment of pure instinct, I thought I could stop it. Leave this island now! Stop! Stop! <laughs> This leads to cognitive dissonance for the audience because we now have two simultaneous versions of the same character, each with different beliefs, ideas, and values. This is why Mark Hamill himself was unable to think of the character as Luke Skywalker. I almost had to think of Luke as another character. Uh, maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. But you cannot have major character development happen off screen when a main character goes through any important emotional or physical changes. We have to see it. There are actually many popular films that made this same mistake. The Dark Knight Rises and The Hunger Games Mockingjay are two more examples of how we end one film with our heroes being inspirational, suffering personal sacrifices but forging heroically onwards despite the odds. Then the third movie begins and the main characters are suddenly broken and sad and uninspiring, 100% the opposite of what we remember. No, please don't. It's just fine. Or don't touch me. Don't. No. No. Get off of me. Batman was willing to be the bad guy, to have the cops chasing him, believing he was a murderer, sacrificing everything for Gotham. He went from being the one crucial thing the city needs to being made completely irrelevant by the Dent Act, all off screen. 1,000 inmates in Blackgate Prison as a direct result of the Dent Act. He's also suddenly broken physically, when we had no hint in either prior movie that he wasn't in anything but tip-top physical condition. Similarly, in the third Hunger Games film, Katniss went from a determined, unstoppable, inspirational leader to being broken down, mopey, unhelpful, and uninspiring. My name is Katniss Everdeen. Yes, her hometown was destroyed, many of her friends were killed, and Peta was taken hostage, but obstacles never phased this woman. I volunteer as tribute! So now, this sudden, broken down version of Katniss seems confusing, and the audience suddenly has two versions of these characters in their head, each with seemingly different beliefs and ideas than the early versions of themselves. Look at Anakin as a comparison. Every single thing that drove him to the dark side, we saw it happen on screen. You're a slave? I'm a person and my name is Anakin. I will come back and free you, Mom. I promise. Go. Young Skywalker is in pain. Terrible pain. I will even learn to stop people from dying. I wasn't strong enough to save you, Mom. I love you. You love me? I'm not the Jedi I should be. Annie, I'm pregnant. You die in childbirth. It was only a dream. I won't let this one become real. But we do not grant you the rank of master. I want more, and I know I shouldn't. More and more, I get the feeling that I'm being excluded from the Council. You're asking me to do something against the Jedi Code. Against the Republic, against a mentor and a friend. That's what's out of place here. He could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. I found a way to save you. I won't lose you, Padme. I'm not gonna die in childbirth, Annie. I promise you. No, I promise you. Learn to know the dark side of the Force, and you will be able to save your wife from certain death. Know the power of the dark side. Power to save Batman. 
To cheat death is a power only one has achieved. But if we work together... I need him! What have I done? I will do whatever you ask. Just help me save Padme's life. Show no mercy. Only then will you be strong enough with the dark side to save Padme. To save Padme. I can't to live save without her. I can't live to without her. I can't live without her. Look at how much pain he is in. Look at how much effort Lucas went to show the transformation. If you are going to take someone pure and turn them into a fallen hero, you must show us the progression of his change. I won't lose you the way I lost my mother, and I'm doing it for you, to protect you. You turned her against me! You will not take her from me! You are the chosen one! I'm a person, and my name is Anakin. It was said that you would destroy this sin, not join them! Stay with me, Mom. Bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness! I can't live without her. Young Skywalker is in pain. Terrible pain. I wasn't strong enough to save you, Mom. To save Padme. I won't lose you, Padme. I can't live without her. Now, of course, I'm not trying to say that people don't change or that extreme character development shouldn't happen. I'm arguing that in most cases, we the audience have to see it. If we don't see them change, our brains have trouble making the connection that they are even the same character. And this problem isn't just restricted to the character of Luke going from epic hero to broken hermit. We also have the tragic tale of Ben Solo, star pupil of legendary Luke Skywalker, except there is no tragic story. We never knew Ben, so his fall to the dark side and all of the trauma we see him deal with in episode 7 means nothing, because we didn't see who he used to be. George Lucas gave us three entire movies, showing us the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker falling to the dark side. Since we never see Ben Solo, the noble young protege that was going to help Luke restore the Jedi Order to its former glory, all we have is Kylo Ren crying for some reason. J.J. wanted this scene to tug at our heartstrings as we saw a son reaching out to his father desperate for help, but the only reason the scene works on any level is because of our nostalgia for Han and because of Adam Driver's magnificent performance. Leave here with me. Come on. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. We, the audience, never saw Han teaching a happy young Kylo to fly or shoot or play sabacc. Subconsciously, we don't care if Kylo comes back to the light side, because that goal represents a whole new character we've never seen before. That's why George Lucas knew it was absolutely essential to spend the prequels watching Anakin grow as a Jedi before he turned. As he is portrayed, Kylo Ren cannot be a tragic, fallen character, because we don't know exactly why he fell. What if he turned to the dark side because he was a moody teenager bored on a Tuesday night and got catfished into force skyping the wrong guy? What if he was being mind-controlled all this time? What if he turned to the dark side because he thought they really did have better cookies? If you want a character to be viewed as a tragic fallen hero, then we must see the hero's journey. Otherwise, we're left watching an inexplicably weepy, emotionally confused villain. The audience had no connection with the bond these two characters share. Just imagine if the sequel trilogy had ended with Ben Solo turning and killing most of the Jedi and Luke had become an emotionally broken hermit, and then Kylo Ren killed Han. We could have accepted that. We still likely would not have liked the decision to kill the Jedi Order again so quickly after just three movies, negating all of the work that Luke put in, but it would have made sense to us because we saw the fall happen slowly over the course of three films, just like we saw with Anakin. There is not a single compelling argument to make in favor of having any major plot points happen off-screen between films. And J.J. didn't just have one or two, he decided to have every single major plot point take place in between episodes 6 and 7 instead of on screen in episode 7. Now, of course, change happens naturally between films all the time, but almost never are these changes major plot points. Characters will get married, have kids, get new jobs, but rarely will any true character development happen off screen. Is it any wonder that fans are having difficulty going from this to this? 
If you see our son, bring him home. When we didn't see any of this. Let's quickly compare what happens between the other six films. Between episodes one and two, Anakin grew up and became a Jedi prodigy. Padme became a senator. Obi-Wan became a wise and respected Jedi Knight. The Separatist movement begins under Count Dooku. Palpatine gains influence as a Chancellor. Between episodes two and three, the Clone Wars have been raging for three years. Grievous infiltrated Coruscant and kidnapped Chancellor Palpatine. The Jedi have changed from peacekeepers to army generals. Anakin became a renowned Jedi Knight. Padme got pregnant, and Obi-Wan became a renowned Jedi Master. Between Episodes 3 and 4, Luke and Leia grew up. Leia became a member of the Senate and a leader in the Rebellion. The Rebellion gained power and influence. The Death Star was completed. The plans for the Death Star were stolen and delivered to Leia. Between Episodes 4 and 5, Luke and Han are promoted within the Rebel Alliance. Luke's Jedi training has progressed, and he shows new abilities. Luke, Han, and Leia have grown closer as friends, and the Rebels had to abandon their base and move to Hoth. Between episodes 5 and 6, Luke builds a new lightsaber and completes his Jedi training. They find where Han is and infiltrate Jabba's palace. The rebels obtain the plans for the new Death Star along with the shuttle Tiderium, and the Emperor finds out about the rebels' attack. And finally, between episodes 6 and 7. <sighs> They dismantled or chased away the rest of the Imperial fleet. They helped establish the New Republic. Han and Leia got married. Han and Leia had a kid. A second empire rises to power. The First Order begins stealing thousands of kids to sell as slave soldiers. The First Order begins building massive super weapons such as Starkiller Base, Snoke's ship, and the Dreadnought. Leia leaves the New Republic and forms the Resistance. The Resistance grows to become a well-known galaxy-wide symbol of Pope. Luke forms a new Jedi Order and begins training students. Ben Solo gets old enough to show he's force sensitive and he begins Jedi training with Luke. A new powerful Sith rises to power from nowhere, even though we know there's never been more than two. Snoke takes over as supreme leader of the First Order. Snoke begins tempting Ben Solo. Ben begins swaying other students to the dark side with him. Whatever the night of Ren are, are established. Ben Solo subdues Luke, then kills most of his classmates and burns down the new Jedi Temple. Luke disappears into exile. Han and Leia break up. Han and Chewie go back to smuggling. Han and Chewie lose the Millennium Falcon. The First Order now has a fully established military. The Force ghosts of Yoda, Anakin, and Obi-Wan have disappeared. Lando and Mon Mothma have disappeared. At least three new Force powers are discovered. Now, I know I'm generalizing a good bit, but does everyone see the problem here? In the previous films, almost the only important things that happen off screen are improvements. People growing older, or getting stronger, or gaining new skills, or getting promotions, or getting pregnant. These are all steps forward that we can come back into the next film glad to see because they move the story along in a positive direction emotionally. Now, in between episodes 6 and 7, not only do we see every major character regress dramatically, we also see for the first time ever major, major storyline aspects have happened off screen. This is very poor storytelling. Yes, there are always exceptions, but most of the time for an audience to be able to accept a character changing, they have to see the change occurring over time in a natural way or they can't identify with the character anymore. What if Rowling announced another Harry Potter book? And in it, Harry has given up magic and exiled himself after Ron and Hermione's son went evil and joined a Voldemort-worshipping cult run by the old Death Eaters who are somehow more powerful than ever. How did all of that happen? It would have been jarring. It would have made no sense to the audience. What if they announced a Lord of the Rings sequel where Aragorn was suddenly no longer king and had reverted back to a broken hermit and there was another one ring to rule them all except it was twice as dangerous as the last one and some different hobbits had to travel to New Mordor and throw it into an even bigger volcano? That would have made no sense. Not just because it's basically the same story repeated over again solely for nostalgia's sake, but it also doesn't make sense because you can't revert every single story arc off screen and have it not feel confusing to the audience. As a final example, let's compare a film similar in concept, The Matrix. We have a chosen one who is found by two wise leaders who train him to use his powers, and the first film, or films, is all about him learning to harness his abilities, and everyone anticipated in the next film we'd really see them come into their powers. Now, let's imagine if the Episode Eight storyline happened with The Matrix 2. In between the first and second Matrix, Neo failed and most of his friends were killed, and he disappears off into The Matrix, exiling himself in disgrace. The movie is all about Trinity searching for Neo, and when she finally finds him, in the last minute of the film, he's a broken-down remnant who's disconnected himself from his Chosen One abilities. Remember when Neo looked like this? And after 32 years, they finally make a sequel, and now he's suddenly like this? If 
the story of the Matrix had gone in this direction, fans would have hated it just as many Star Wars fans hated Luke in The Last Jedi. And the ironic thing is, it isn't necessarily the character changing that fans hated, it's the fact that the change happened off screen so we never saw the transition and thus can't identify with the new character. This is how J.J. Abrams single-handedly destroyed all three sequels. We needed to see these things happen on screen for the story to feel natural and make sense. I am not a fan of any aspect of the storyline that Ryan Johnson decided to go with, but the only reason he had so much leeway to do what he did was because J.J. Abrams created an ambiguous, fluctuating storyline that had every single major plot point happen off screen, leaving us as an audience confused and disconnected from every bit of character development regarding the established heroes. I expect film schools will be tearing apart The Last Jedi for years to come as an example of what an incohesive, poorly written script looks like, but the harsh fact is the downfall of the Star Wars franchise began here, with J.J. completely failing as a storyteller. In a Q&A with co-writers J.J. Abrams, Michael Arndt, and Lawrence Kasdan, Arndt admitted that Luke wasn't in the film because they couldn't figure out how to have him in a scene without upstaging everyone. He said, It just felt like every time Luke came in and entered the movie, he just took it over. Suddenly, you didn't care about your main character anymore because, Oh, f Luke Skywalker's here. I want to see what he's going to do. I know this wasn't your quote, Mr. Abrams, but you were in charge of this film. If you can't introduce new characters and have us care about them, they are not well-written characters and you've failed as a writer. It's very normal for a competent writer to introduce new characters who are in nearly every scene as an established favorite and yet are not overshadowed. I mean, Mara Jade is basically introduced side by side with Luke throughout the Thrawn trilogy, and she's a huge fan favorite. That series also introduced Thrawn and Sabath, who also became fan favorites, despite also having Luke and Leia and Han in the story. And Thanos is one of the greatest villains we've ever seen. We only had one film that really established his character. And notice how he's able to be in a scene with Loki without totally being overshadowed? And notice they didn't set Robert Downey Jr. or Chris or Chris or Chris off to the side so they could focus on the new guys? And how they managed to introduce a dozen new characters next to the old ones and still even have the minor characters stand out? Don't say it! Don't you say I it! You left. Come on! You should be ashamed of yourself. You should take another laugh. Did you just take it? I assume you just took it. The Force Awakens was badly written, its storyline was fractured and incomplete, its characters were underdeveloped, and it set a terrible precedent for what the future of the Star Wars franchise would be. Now, despite my harsh words, I obviously don't believe the franchise is beyond saving. If I did, then I still wouldn't be a fan. However, I do believe the sequel trilogy is beyond saving. Episode 8 not only didn't fill in any plot holes, but it created a nearly unprecedented number of new ones. Episode 9 won't be able to retroactively fill in enough of these plot holes to make the sequel trilogy feel like a uniform story that naturally continues our hero's journey after Return of the Jedi. The future of the franchise will be in how Disney approaches the next film after Episode 9. I wouldn't be surprised to see them start from scratch and count Episodes 1 through 9 as the Skywalker saga, which Rey will likely be revealed to be a part of. Then they'll start over again with Episode 1, following a new Jedi and what will be dubbed a fresh new beginning for the Star Wars franchise. And if they can give us a cohesive storyline that's not packed with open-ended, mysterious possibilities, and give us character development we can actually follow on screen, then maybe the next part of the franchise will have a shot. Granted, that'll put us right back to where we were in 1977, with brand new characters the audience has to grow to love. Hello there. But if Disney puts the right directors in charge this time, and puts the story group 100% in charge of all major plot points, then at least the franchise will have the chance to start over. At least once again, the franchise will have a new hope. Mm -hmm.